If we can get from point A to point B in a complicated way or a simple way, let's go the simple way. For this video, point A is the idea for a mosaic and point B is the final mosaic. To make this simple, I've created an Inkscape mosaic process that follows the KISS principle. You might be aware that KISS stands for keep it simple and then a derogatory S word for a person. I'm going to change the phrase to keep it super simple instead. This design principle was first used by the U.S. Navy in 1960. The idea is that simplicity guarantees the greatest level of user acceptance and interaction. This is especially important in the military. A mechanical repair needs to be simple enough to complete with basic training and simple tools. Otherwise, it could cost lives. Here's the mosaic from our thumbnail as the primary example for the video. And then here's another one I made the other day. The ideal candidates for this process are designs with gentle curves and shapes arranged either vertically or horizontally. This process also helps us adhere to some of the ancient Roman mosaic design rules. Number one, the tile spacing should be consistent. Number two, the tile sizes should also be fairly consistent. Number three, triangles should be limited. And number four, the grout lines should be staggered, which means the lines of tiles are offset from each other. Here's also a remake of the last video's butterfly mosaic. I used the process on the interior shapes, which are now more representative of a real mosaic design. It is a lot more work with closed shapes like these, so I'd rather use it to create designs like the two earlier examples that I showed you. Let's go through the four phases of this process with the mountains example. If you're interested, you can download this process guide and its associated calculator with a link I've got in the description, and there are some instructions there too. You'll just need to enter your email address, or you can even make one up. For phase one of the project, we want to prepare our design. We need to select a template either from a drawing, a vector image, or a photo. In my case, I found a photo on Vecteezy. I used filters of photos that are non-AI images. My search term was Blue Ridge Mountains, and on page two of the results is the photo I chose. There's a link for Vecteezy in the description if you'd like to check it out. The next step is to have the template and the page be the same size, and you can scale either one. So here I found the dimensions of the photo, then I changed the dimensions of the page to match that, and then I aligned the photo to the center of the page. The next thing I'll do is draw some line segments with the Bezier pen. Now when I have nothing selected and I activate the pen, I want to make sure my stroke and fill settings are what I want. And you can see these in the upper right hand corner. To set the stroke, I hold the shift key and select one of the swatches at the bottom. And to turn off the fill, I just click the red X at the bottom left. In the upper right, we can see the result of these changes. And I can also see that the stroke width is two pixels. The first thing I'll do is draw the outline of the photo, and because it's a rectangle, I can just turn snapping on and draw each corner and close it up. The next thing I'll do is draw overlapping line segments for all the dominant curves in the photo. I'll do the bottom one first, and as you can see, I've got corner nodes for all the nodes, so I'll change the interior ones to smooth so it matches the curve better. That looks pretty good as it is, but we could always fine tune it if we need to. The reason I use overlapping lines is so that later when I use the shape builder, it will recognize each of the shapes. So here are the remaining line segments I chose to create. Now we're done with our template so we can move that aside. And we can also duplicate all these line segments and move that copy aside as well. Now to get our shapes, I'll duplicate the segments on the page again, and then I'll use the shape builder tool to capture each individual shape. While all the shapes are still selected, I'll give them a temporary light blue color. I'll take away their stroke and I'll drop them to the bottom. So now it's time to choose the colors for these shapes. And I didn't have any luck sampling colors from the photo. So I came up with my own color swatches, starting with a couple shades of green at the bottom and working my way up with shades of blue. If you want to recreate this, I provided the RGB codes for you here. 
To sample these Color Swatch colors, I'm going to use the dropper tool. When I hover over that, you can see that the keyboard shortcut for this is D. And then I'll have to toggle back to the selection tool, which has a shortcut of S. So while I have the selection tool activated, I'll select the bottom shape, press D to get to the dropper tool, sample the color I want, and then immediately press S to get back to the selection tool and work my way up through all the shapes using that process. Now, as I'm doing this, I just want to stress that once you've selected a color with the dropper tool, make sure to immediately go back to the selection tool. Otherwise, the next click you make will change the color to whatever you happen to click. For now, I'll leave the sky as light blue so I can figure out what to do with that later. I'm also noticing that for the smallest shape, I actually filled in the line segment with a fill. I need to undo that, click the shape, and give it the color I want. This could be a good time to sit back and look at the color choices, see if they're acceptable, and you could always change them now to get something that you really like. Now I'll select everything, duplicate it, and move that copy off to the side, and we're done with phase one. Now in phase two, we'll add the tiles to our design. The first thing we want to decide is what size should our tiles be? So I'll draw a temporary line segment. Then I'll draw a square, and let's make it 20 by 20 pixels. We'll copy it so it's in the clipboard. Then we can use pattern along path to get the tiles onto the line. We want to have the right options every time that pattern along path is used, so let's set that up first. For pattern copies, we want repeated, and then down near the bottom, we want to check the box for offsets in unit of pattern size. That will help us with the calculator further on. In order to save that, use the drop down at the right top to set it as the custom default. Now we can choose our pattern source, and I always use the last option to link to what's in the clipboard. And by habit, I'm going to change the fill color to light green and take away the stroke. Then we can choose a spacing size to see how that looks. Now we can drag those tiles onto the template to see how it looks. We can rotate it. And I think I'm going to make it a little smaller for a 15 by 15 pixel square. We can also use the nodes tool on this path to change its length, for example, or move the nodes around. I think a spacing closer to 0.1 would look better. So now we can use this calculator to enter some values into the light green shaded areas. Our tile size is 15 pixels, so that's the unit of measure. If we choose two pixels to be our spacing, you'll see that it calculates a spacing value of 0 0.13. Two is 13% of 15, and that's how that value is calculated. The top of the calculator just shows the requirements to use this tool, and we set those defaults already for pattern along path. So let's start adding tiles. We'll start with the bottom shape. We'll use its top line segment to add the tiles using pattern along path. Now here's an important thing. We want to set the fill color to a color that's not being used anywhere else in the project. I'm going to use this lime green every time we do a shape. Now we want this tile to have a space between it and the shape above it, so we can enter the line one offset pixels into the calculator, and below it tells us what the normal offset value should be to achieve this. The math behind this is because the tiles are straddling the line segment, so we need to move them down by half a tile, that's 0.5, and our spacing value of 0.13, and that's how we get the 0.63. So let's go ahead and apply the spacing value and the normal offset value from the calculator. We want to raise these tiles to the top level, and we will not apply object to path on this line of tiles, but we will on all the succeeding ones. Now if we zoom in, we can see the spacing between this line of tiles and the shape above it is the same as the spacing between the tiles. Now for every line after this, we'll duplicate line one, We'll apply all the pattern along path values from the calculator. And you'll notice that every other line has a tangential offset of half a tile. At the bottom of the calculator, you'll see that every line starting with line two is offset an additional 1.13 units from the line above it. Once the tiles are in place, 
We'll use object to path to finalize that and path break apart to separate all the tiles in this line. At this point, we can examine all the tiles to see if any of them need to be modified to keep them looking good. And now it's just a matter of repeating this process for each of the following lines. Here we have all the lines, and I kept going until the entire shape is covered by tiles. I didn't do any of the fixing of tiles yet, so you can get an idea of what can happen. We have this area here where the tiles started getting bunched up, and then on the other end, we have the same issue. And then because we didn't draw our line segment long enough to off the right edge of the design, we didn't fill the entire shape. So now I'll go ahead and zoom in and apply what I call cosmetic surgery to fixing any of the areas where the tiles are overlapping or not big enough or need to be added. And to do this, I can use a delete operation so I can add additional tiles with the Bezier pen. I can duplicate tiles and I can use the nodes tool. I'll just fix a few examples here, and then I'll do the rest in the background. Okay, I cleaned up all the areas that needed it. Now we're ready to finalize the tiles for this shape. First thing we need to do is apply object to path for line one. We can also apply path break apart like we did for all the other lines. Then we can select any of the tiles, right click, and use select, same, fill color to select all of the tiles for this shape. Now you can see why it's important for them all to be the same unique color. Group them all together and drop them to the lower level. Deselect the tiles, then select the shape and use shift to select the tiles below it and use set clip to keep just the tiles that fit inside the shape. Hey, that looks good. Now we can set the final color of the tiles. We can either use a swatch if you made one or go back to your copy of the shapes that we made and sample it from there. Okay, I just rinsed and repeated all these steps for each of these shapes, working from the bottom to the top and selected each of the final colors. Starting to look pretty good. So now I need to decide what to do with the sky and I wasn't getting much inspiration from the template photograph. Here was my first idea of just adding these straight tiles across and giving them different colors. That was a little bit boring, so I went a little recursive and took that shape for the sky and broke it up with some more line segments like this, so it looks more like a sunset. Then I used the shape builder as before, and I selected some new colors for the sky, and if you want to repeat that, here are the RGB codes. Okay, so here are all the completed tiles. The last thing we need to do is if we have any stray line segments left over from phase one, we want to delete those and then group the whole thing together. Now we're ready for phase three to add the grout background. So we can go over to our duplicate of the original line segments, duplicate those, and use the shape builder to combine all the shapes together into one shape. Now, since we already had the rectangle drawn, which is the same thing, we can use that instead. So we'll give it our desired fill color, which in my case will be black and we'll get rid of the stroke. Now we want a two pixel border, so we'll use the offset path effect to give us that. Then we can apply object to path to finalize that. Then with the background still selected, we can use shift select on the tiles and align the background to the tiles and drop the background to the bottom level. We'll want to group everything together again. Now we're ready for phase four, which will be to add any final embellishments that we want. Here I've got a duplicate of the final design. I'm going to add some text to the bottom. I'll position it and resize it so it looks good under the design. Then I'll group those two things together. So now I can create a rectangle for a bigger background. I can group that all together and then we're done. We have a nice completed design. Now let me quickly switch to the flag project where I can point out some areas where you need to make a little slight change to the process. Here you can see I was making the blue area where I used the top line for the whole flag and you can see the tiles started getting bunched up really badly towards the right side and then down towards the bottom the tiles started getting way too big. The solution was to do this part over and draw a more gradual curve and so the tiles are looking much better now. 
Then from the original template, you can see I still have to do the stars, and there were also some shadow areas that I wanted to capture in a different way. So using the template, I traced out one of the stars, and I added a grout background to that, repeated it 50 times, and placed them in the same areas as they are in the template. Then I grouped them all together so I could transfer them to my new design. For the shadows, I traced out each of those shapes and made them black. Then I was able to use the opacity slider from the fill and stroke menu to lighten them up and make them a little transparent. So here's the final flag design with everything put together, and I refreshed all of the colors to make them a little brighter. So that's it for this process. Let's go to the outro for a few final comments. Well, that was a lot of fun, and I hope you got some value out of this video. I'm now standing in front of the actual Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm glad you're still watching. Thanks for doing so. And why don't you go ahead and subscribe if you already haven't. Now let's take a look at this beautiful scenery. Now, before I go, I have a couple of requests for you. Number one, if you're interested in sharing your artwork in a future video, please send it to me. I'd love to see what you're doing. And second, if you have any ideas for things you'd like to see in the future, please send those to me as well. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.